Hey, Internet. This is the second part of a Worldview Everlasting Primer on Baptism. And just in case you missed it last week, here's a recap. <coughs> What is baptism? Baptism is water, but it's not just water. It is water that is being used in the inclusion with God's command, God's word. I recognize then that this baptism is not a work of man. It is not the hand pouring the water, which is the baptism. It is the water and the word. So does that mean that when you're done, the water is like some mystical, magical water that you can like sprinkle on things and make demons go away and stuff? Well, no, not so much. It is not the water itself, but the baptism, the using of that water with the word of God to wash you. So is God the Father then present? Yes. He is there adopting you as his son. He is establishing a covenant with you. Jesus, of course, is also present in baptism. St. Paul clearly says this in Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? All right, so is the Holy Spirit also present in baptism? Yes, and we would point to John 3 verse 5 where Jesus says that one must be born of both water and the Spirit. So on the basis of all this, Lutherans do not believe that baptism is merely a human and word. It is the work of the Trinity by the power of the Trinity's word. Now, of course, none of this means don't repent. None of this means you don't live a life of daily renewal and drowning your flesh and being raised again through the word and the sacramental spirituality of the Lord's Supper. But then aren't we kind of diverting people from Christ and pointing them to baptism instead of Christ? Far from being diverted from Christ by this baptism, those who come to believe what the scriptures say about it are led even deeper and closer to him to understand and rely on him more and more so that every time I say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and remember I'm baptized into that name, who am I putting my faith in? Not me, not the pastor, and not the water by itself, but the Jesus Christ Lord who died and rose for me, and I know has claimed me as his own. It's a rock on kind of thing. But what if someone who's baptized rejects repentance and clearly has no faith, you know, goes off and lives some sort of licentious lifestyle and even, you know, curses God? Well, here's the thing. The salutary fruits, promises, and blessings which are spoken of and given in baptism are apprehended, received, beneficial to you by faith alone. Therefore, faith. So without faith, even though the promise is still there in real, you are not receiving it. I can give you a check for a hundred bucks. If you tear it up, you don't have the hundred bucks. doesn't make the check invalid. So where there is no repentance and one pursues evil and unbelief on purpose, then there certainly is no saving faith. To spurn and reject one's own baptism is to spurn and reject Christ. And so even though such have been baptized, they are under and remain under God's divine punishment and wrath, his promise that he will cast into eternal flame all who do not trust in Christ. He that does not believe shall be condemned, as Mark 16 says. Well, then what about if someone falls away from this pledge of baptism and then is converted again later in life? Did their baptism not count? Actually, that's a Roman Catholic teaching. The papists teach that once the ark of baptism is dashed to pieces and broken on the ground, destroyed by sin, it cannot be repaired. And so a Roman Catholic who would later in life repent is not to return to their baptismal covenant as a source of hope, but to seize the second plank of salvation, as they say, namely repentance and works. Hmm. Our position as Lutherans is quite diametrical to that. God forbid that our unbelief should make his faithfulness to no effect. Check out Romans 3.3 or 2 Timothy 2.13 if you want proof for that. As the ancient church has said, baptism is like the door through which you enter into fellowship with God. If you walk out of the door and refuse to believe the door is there, the door is still there. And repentance and trust in the word calling you still is the power of God to turn you back to face him again. And the door is still there. It's still open for you. It's the same promise, the same adoption, the same gift of entry into fellowship with God. So baptism is always a way for you, even as one who fell away, to come back and access your faith again. It is a promise to be believed. And for faith and through faith, it saves you. Let's think of Jeremiah 3. If a man divorces his wife because she goes from him and joins another lover, would he take her back? Would he let this whore come back to him? Faithless Israel, she took her whoredom lightly and polluted the land. So the Lord said, Return to me, faithless Israel. I will not look on you with anger. I am merciful. Now that's not baptism itself, but that's exactly how baptism works. So then is baptism to be repeated if we fall? May Geneta. May it never be. Those of you who've gone through that process, just know it's brand new. The ancient church never once did this. It just got made up about 400 years ago and...
and it means nothing. I mean, don't worry about it. If you want to, you know, if you get worried about it, don't worry about it. Your first one counted. Yeah. So there is one faith, one Lord, one Father and God of all, one baptism, as Paul says. The covenant God made with us in that one baptism is everlasting. It is a seal testifying to you that God will keep his grace toward you. You can't apply that seal more than once. It stays. It's his word. It doesn't go away. So as little as a man in Israel who fell away from the faith and returned would need to be circumcised again, so little does baptism mean to be repeated. Now that doesn't change the fact that by daily drowning you ought to be renewed in that same baptism. And in that sense, baptism is not a one-time act, but it is repetitive all the time, all the days of your life. But that's a very different thing. It's the one baptism forever. Not multiple baptisms because mm, I don't think it does anything. And why would you do it again if it doesn't do anything? I mean, that, that's weird. Anyway, and this is then the regeneration and the renewal that Paul speaks of in Titus and in Romans. That baptism continues, that it is permanent, that it is an ongoing killing and raising of you in repentance through the word and promises of Christ. You're planted in Christ's death on the cross so that your sins are forgiven so that you will, and this is what God will do in you, mortify your current flesh. You will be crucifying and burying your own sin on a regular basis every day by the power of faith alone. The Holy Spirit will reign in your body rather than you reigning in your body because you're kind of a tyrant and tend to do wicked things. Well, the Spirit's coming along. He's taking control again. And you're still there. This is the cool thing. He doesn't like get rid of you. You don't become a robot, but he reigns. His goodwill for you takes over. His promises go forth. This is to then walk in the newness of life of Christ's resurrection, to be dead to the world now, alive with Christ, already seated in the highest places, already participants in the life of the world to come. Now, not yet. Ahead of time, still trapped with our flesh and yet freed of conscience to see the way things really are. So can baptism be used to exhort people to good works? That's kind of what Paul does in Romans 6. When we come to baptism, God has promised us grace and he has raised us to new life. At baptism, we ask this question in the Lutheran church. Do you renounce the devil? Do you renounce his works? Do you renounce his ways? And we or the sponsors of the infant answer, yes, I renounce him. This is part of baptismal life. It is a horrible sin to impudently violate that covenant by choosing evil and sin in your life. That would be an unchristian thing to do. And one could speak to a baptized person and say that. Stop that. You're baptized. Don't act like someone who's not a Christian. You are hindering and destroying the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And this really should be our prayer anyway, that we would pray to the Spirit that he would mortify the works of our flesh in us and keep us rooted in the new root, the new Adam, the resurrected man, into whom we are baptized, Christ. Okay, so what about the effects of baptism? Are they immediate? Are they finished? I'm going to read straight out what I've been kind of using as a resource so far. Ministry, Word, and Sacraments, and Interidian by Martin Kennett, one of the great teachers of the Lutheran Church. He answers that question this way. Regeneration indeed, that is, adoption and forgiveness of sins, is complete and finished in belief believers immediately after baptism, and yet it nevertheless extends through the whole life of a man. But renewal is indeed begun in baptism and grows daily, but is finally completed in the life to come. For this present life, renewal is still imperfect and should grow and increase from day to day. So the answer is, does everything happen at baptism or is it only kind of part of it that goes on? No, well, everything happens at baptism and yet it continues to grow in you against your flesh from day to day the rest of your life. Yeah? It's a now not yet thing. It's, an, it's, a, it's a both and thing. You don't want to kind of just kill one side of the issue because the other side maybe doesn't line up in a in a temporal sense. Christ has already risen. It's all done. You're still here waiting. Yeah? So then, what about the babies? Are infants to be baptized? Well, are infants sinners? Do they need Jesus to be saved? Is he the only way, truth, and life? Does no one come to the Father but through him? Hmm? Not only has baptism of infants always been observed everywhere in the Christian church until the radical reformation departed and formed that fourth leg of the church, which sometimes still baptizes infants, but generally speaking, at least in America, doesn't. But even in the early church, when teaching infant baptism, the church fathers would always quote this passage when parents of children were bringing their babies, infants is the word in the Greek, to Jesus to have him bless them. The disciples got a little upset about this. They rebuked them. They sent them away. And Jesus got upset at the disciples and said, stop it. Let the little children come to me for these are are the such kinds of which the kingdom of heaven belongs to. That is, the helpless, the weak, the totally trapped in sin ones, the ones who cannot do a thing to save themselves. In this sense, infant baptism is the best example of what all baptism is. It's the adult baptism that kind of is the lying symbol that makes it look as if we're participating or doing something ourselves in it, when really what's going on even as an adult is God is treating you like an infant. <laughs> He's saying, you can't help yourself here, I'm gonna help you. Now because as we've said, the text 
texts of scripture are clear, regeneration, rebirth, renewal, Holy Spirit, new life, forgiveness, all this is in baptism. Why would you not give this to a sinner who is helpless and can't save themselves? I mean, with what you know about sin and the evil desires of your heart, would you really rather have the chance to reject it? I mean, really, I mean, I personally, I kind of wish I'd missed life. Like I slept and, and God saved me, right? I didn't even know what happened. I woke up and I was in paradise and I just kind of missed the rest of this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. So if it's possible for little children to become partakers of heaven, and if baptism is clearly the scriptural doorway in which we all become partakers of heaven, well then yes, we should baptize children. I mean, does not all nations include children? The promise without an application doesn't benefit anyone. If it's not given to you, how can you even grow to believe it? Christ has said this. He said, it's not the will of the Father that even one of these little ones should perish. Well, if God saves through Jesus and Jesus saves by baptizing you, well then, goodness, it makes a whole lot of sense. All humans are conceived and born in sin, and are by nature children of wrath. They too, as infants, must receive forgiveness of sins for their inherited original sin from Adam and for every selfish thought and, yeah, deed, which they do from conception onward. It's not like they're thinking about you and having a lot of charity and love for the world. So as scripture says in Galatians, Christ is put on them in baptism. You could also make an argument that because baptism does succeed circumcision, this is the Colossians 2 stuff, and circumcision was given to infants, I mean, there's pretty good precedent too. If you read that Jeremiah's book, you'll see all sorts some more good arguments for how the context mandated baptism of infants. I mean, did you know that before Christ came to become a Jew, you had to also be baptized in a traditional washing? And as a convert, you and your family would be baptized, and they would, of course, baptize an infant of any parent who converted? Do you know that most of the worship practices of the early church did kind of grow out of the synagogue? I mean, it's not like that's final proof, but when the text is so clear with what it says, it kind of is the nail in the coffin. Or should I say the stone rolled away from the tomb? Yeah. But there's nowhere in the Bible that says you need to baptize infants. You're right. There's also nowhere in the Bible that says you don't baptize infants. So, hey, we're at an impasse there. Let's look at what the texts actually say. Yeah? <laughs> uh, and frankly, you can make a case from the families and the households and stuff, although it's still kind of almost an argument from silence. By itself is not enough, but with all the evidence together, you have to be stubborn and willfully obstinate to reject what the texts are saying. But doesn't Christ say baptize and teach? Of course he says baptize and teach. Why would you not immediately go home and start teaching your infant? I mean, don't you read stories to your kids? Don't you teach the Bible to your kids? And we have this great thing in the Lutheran church called the small catechism. It's great for helping the kids to memorize the basics of the faith, stuff like that. Yes, one must be taught. How do you expect that faith to be fed? If baptism is the birth, the word of God is food to give the infant, the newborn's milk. But it's written in Mark 16, he that believes and is baptized. Okay, well to make belief a prerequisite is to impose on the grammar something the grammar is not doing, as if this is kind of an order thing. Hey, just throwing this in here as I'm editing and I think about it, because based on that argument, you would have to baptize people before you ever teach them, based on Matthew 28, because it says baptizing and teaching. So you couldn't teach children until they passed the age of accountability. See what I'm saying? On top of that, you're assuming that the infants can't believe or don't believe before that. You've got no proof of that. How do you know that by being around the Word of God with their Christian parents, God has not, in the same way that he opened the ears of men at Pentecost, opened the ears of the infants to hear words that maybe they don't understand, but nonetheless are creating faith? Now, again, that's an argument from silence. You don't know, but that's the point. You don't no. Yeah? So don't make rules based on what you don't know. Instead, base it on what you know. Yes, it says teach and baptize. He that believes shall be saved. Yes, so baptism is connected to faith. We never deny that as Lutherans. And the family that doesn't go home and continue to draw that child into faith has abused this wonderful gift of God and is confessing by their actions that they don't even know what it is. So what about those who teach that children of believers, even without baptism, are heirs to eternal life? And we'll go from here again. This is an ancient error that Augustine condemned in the Pelagians and refuted De Baptismo Pavulorum, Book 2, Chapter 25 and 26. In defense of their error, they misapplied the same passage as the Calvinists want. That is, the Pelagians and the Calvinists had the same argument. Some real irony in that, eh? 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Even though in that passage only this point is made, that a believing wife can in good conscience live with an unbelieving husband and bear him children. This is true because it says that they are holy because she's holy, but it says that of the unbelieving husband too. So unless you're going to make the argument the unbelieving husband saved simply by being married to a believing wife, you can't make that argument for the children from that text. Yeah. Jeremiah says a nice section on that. Paul roundly and without distinction declares regarding all things that we bring with us when we are born into this world. In Ephesians chapter 2, we were by nature children of wrath. Also we, says Paul, who have been born of circumcised parents, for that which is born of the flesh is flesh and cannot enter the kingdom of God. The promise of grace surely applies also to little children, but there must be an application of that promise so that the little children are brought to Christ. It has been shown above that the very thing takes place in baptism. So there you go. There's a kind of quick primer on baptism, which covers a lot of the 
information, although not all of it, there's more of it out there. In summary, let me just give you the small catechism rundown, make it nice, short, and sweet. What is baptism? Baptism is not just water. It's water included in God's command by the power of his word. Where is this word? Well, Matthew chapter 28. Go baptize into the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Oh, and by the way, teach him too. What benefits does this washing with water and the word do? It works forgiveness of sins by the merit of Christ. That is, it applies his merit to you and thus rescues you from death through his death and resurrection and also rescues you from the devil, from his victory over that arch enemy. In this way, it gives eternal salvation. Baptism now saves you, as Peter says. This giving is given to all who believe those words. Eh? Where are these words written? Mark 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But how can water do such great things? Ha ha ha, certainly not just the water, <laughs> but the word of God in and with the water does these great things. And faith trusts this word. For without the word, it's just water. It's not a baptism. With the word, it's a baptism. That is a life-giving bath, rich in grace, washing and renewing in the regeneration of the Holy Spirit's deposit for you, for faith, for life eternal. He saved us through the washing of rebirth by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace alone and not by any work of man, we might become heirs, that is, be adopted as sons, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. So that's it, you're just saved. It doesn't indicate anything more about the Christian life. That's just magic. It indicates that the old Adam in you, your flesh, your sin, should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned, mortified, crucified, and put to death dying with every sin and evil desire in you as you restrain your ego, so that the new man, bonded to the mind of Christ, shall emerge daily through forgiveness, living in God until that day when we need no more forgiveness because he's come again to give us everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. How can you say that? Because the Bible does. Romans 6, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Surely that is a glory is error, if error it be, which springs from trusting too far, too implicitly, into childlike a way in the simple words of our adorable Lord. Amen, amen, yea, yea, verily, verily, tis so very much. So, rock on. Hmm. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>